Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Smoking Joe Biden was on fire during the State of the Union address. He was lit, delivered a compelling vision for the American people, and crushed MAGA extremism. Questions? Yeah, President Biden laid out a comprehensive vision for uh, fixing our broken immigration system and addressing the challenges at the border. He also acknowledged the horrific nature of the murder and, of course, emphasized the need more generally to keep our communities safe. To follow up on that question, there are members of your caucus who were upset with his language. Do you have a response to that? Joe Biden delivered an incredible speech that was very well received by the American people, beginning, middle, and end. Kevin? Uh, Two very distinctively different things. One, um, the TikTok legislation is seemingly going to the floor next week. Where do you stand on that legislation? Do you support it? And uh, two, you have a photo of um, George Santos on the poster beside you. Uh, What do you make of the fact that he is back on the scene here in Capitol Hill and is apparently running in New York 1? With respect to the TikTok-related legislation, there was a strongly bipartisan vote uh, that is impressive in nature in any instance, but particularly as it relates to something in the social media space, which hasn't always been easy for Democrats and Republicans to find common ground. I look forward to having a conversation with Frank Pallone, uh, as well as Raja Krishnamoorthy, the lead Democrat on the legislation, about the way forward in advance of floor consideration. Uh, In regards to the news that came out just before the Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to address my favorite topic. (laughs) I was waiting for it. it. It's kind of an extraordinary thing that this guy won't go away. But it's indicative of the reality that there's a clear choice in terms of what the American people face between Democrats and Republicans between a vision that President Biden laid out to move America forward and build an economy that's healthy and that puts working families, middle-class families, and those who aspire to be part of the middle class first, as compared to the extreme MAGA Republicans who want to turn back the clock. And in stick us with massive tax cuts for the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected. Marjorie Taylor Greene and George Santos are running the House Republican Conference. And at this point, it's Marjorie Taylor Greene on the inside and Santos on the outside, but clearly he's trying to come back. Now, here's the choice that the American people are going to face over the next few months. Team normal versus team chaos. Team reasonable versus team dysfunction. And team get stuff done versus team extreme. Team Biden versus team Marjorie Taylor Green and George Santos, and that's a clear choice for the American people. I was wondering what was happening in this side of the room. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one thing that didn't get mentioned last night was the farm bill, and that's up for reauthorization this year. Do you still have confidence that that could get done in 2024, or will you need to uh, extend it again? It's my hope uh, that we are going to be able to get the farm bill done uh, by the end of the fiscal year and or the calendar year, 
and Democrats as we have been committed in other areas will continue uh, to find bipartisan common ground with our Republican colleagues. As we've said, on any issue, whenever and wherever possible, in order to make life better for the American people, the Farm Bill has always been bipartisan. And as long as the extreme MAGA Republicans in the House recognize that reality, they can't govern without Democratic support. Every single thing that has happened in this Congress that meaningfully impacts the American people in a positive way has been because House Democrats have provided a majority of the votes necessary to get things done. And that, of course, will be the case as it relates to the Farm Bill. I'll stick on this side. Over on the Senate side, there's some Republican infighting over earmarks and the government funding package. I believe you have some of your own in the minibus. What do you make of the backlash earmarks receive when they are allowed? Well, community-funded projects uh, are an important part of enabling members of Congress on both sides of the aisle to identify priorities related to the expenditure of taxpayer dollars. And that authority rests with the Congress, not anybody else, according to the Constitution, the Congress. And so I do think it's important in a very modest way, which is the case connected to community funded projects that are heavily vetted to make sure that they are equitable and effective and efficient expenditures of taxpayer resources, that it's a part of the appropriations process that is bipartisan and advances the ball for the American people. On Ukraine, some Republicans have started to float the idea of making a loan guarantee as a way to get them the funds they need to carry out the war. Is that something that Democrats would be open to considering if it meant getting Ukraine aid sooner than waiting for Speaker Johnson to bring up the Senate supplemental, which seems very clearly not going to happen? The only way forward with respect to meeting the national security needs of the American people uh, is for House Republicans to put the bipartisan national security comprehensive bill sent over from the Senate on the floor for an up or down vote. And everybody in the House knows that were that to happen, there will be about 300 votes or more in support of the bipartisan comprehensive national security bill. So we can meet the needs of our allies, our Democratic allies in Ukraine, in Israel, in the Indo-Pacific, and also surge humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians in Gaza who are in harm's way through no fault of their own, and also civilians in theaters of war all across the country. The bipartisan, comprehensive, Senate-passed national security bill is the only way forward. We need an up or down vote. It's time for the House Republicans to support the national security interests of the American people and break from the pro-Putin MAGA extremists in their party. Given the decorum from last night, is there some prospect for real bipartisanship uh, before the next election within this Congress? Well, we are going to continue uh, to find bipartisan common ground, exercising common sense whenever and wherever possible with our Republican colleagues on any issue. And we've done that repeatedly from the very beginning of this Congress with respect to avoiding a catastrophic default on our nation's debt, funding the government, repeatedly keeping it open and avoiding a shutdown, passing the National Defense Authorization Act, securing $16 billion in assistance for communities that have been devastated by extreme weather events, passing tax legislation that includes the low-income housing tax credit and an enhanced child tax credit, and most recently, providing the majority of votes necessary to get the first six appropriations bills over the finish line. We are going to continue to govern in a common sense way, and we're just asking our Republican colleagues to stop the political stunts. That was an embarrassment last night. 
a complete embarrassment. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's basically running the House Republican conference, shows up in campaign paraphernalia. And then these people want to lecture Joe Biden because he delivered a strong and forceful speech that made them uncomfortable because he exposed their lies and shamelessness. We have one message for extreme MAGA Republicans who want to lecture us about the quorum. Get lost. You're a joke. Exhibit A, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Exhibit B, George Santos. I was worried you weren't going to come back to me, but um, to talk, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, President Biden's announcement that he had just before State of the Union, but he did talk about it briefly during his speech, the emergency pier being set up uh, on the coast of Gaza. Uh, can you talk, about, uh, talk to me about the significance of having that, especially as it's been a growing concern uh, for many within your own party? It was an important announcement in the context of making sure that we can surge humanitarian assistance uh, to Gaza in order to address the clear needs of Palestinian civilians who are in harm's way in a theater of war through no fault of their own, as President Biden articulated. There are three pressing things that need to be accomplished in the context of the war between Israel uh, and Hamas. Israel, as President Biden articulated, has a clear, unequivocal right to defend itself against Hamas, a brutal terrorist organization that inflicted unspeakable atrocities on 10-7. At the same time, we need to make sure that we get the hostages out and can surge humanitarian assistance in to Gaza. And the announcement with respect to establishing a pier that will facilitate surging humanitarian assistance should be welcomed by everyone. Because no one should be able to accept the suffering that we've seen in Israel and now the casualties and the conditions that civilians are dealing with. And as President Biden appropriately pointed out, because Hamas could care less about its own citizens. And that's a very challenging situation. And there's a clear need for the United States to step in in the way that President Biden has articulated. So I think, unless I'm mistaken, the Fitzpatrick discharge petition for his version of the Ukraine aid matures today. And I think a couple days ago you mentioned there might be one more crack at changes that might need to happen in the event that try to win over some Democratic members uh, to support that measure. Have you spoken with him at all about what those changes might have to be in order to win over uh, members from your side of the aisle? Well, President Biden made clear during the State of the Union address that we have to make sure we are surging humanitarian assistance into theaters of war across the world. And it's not a dime of humanitarian assistance in the legislation that has been introduced by Representative Fitzpatrick. So that's a non-starter for the House Democratic Caucus. Thank you, everyone. The House will come to order. Speaker Mike Johnson, Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi, Whip Clark, Chairman Aguilar, all of my colleagues in government on both sides of the aisle, 
It's an honor and a privilege to once again stand before you as House Democratic leader. From the very beginning of this Congress, House Democrats have made clear that we will find bipartisan common ground with our Republican colleagues whenever and wherever possible for the good of the American people. And House Democrats have repeatedly done just that. It was House Democrats who provided a majority of the votes necessary to avoid a catastrophic default on our debt that would have crashed the U.S. economy and triggered a job-killing recession. It was House Democrats who provided a majority of the votes necessary to avoid a government shutdown that would have hurt everyday Americans. It was House Democrats who provided a majority of the votes necessary to secure $16 billion in disaster assistance for Americans whose lives have been devastated by extreme weather events. From the very beginning of this Congress, House Democrats have been governing for the people. We continue to look forward to finding bipartisan common ground whenever and wherever possible. House Democrats will continue to partner with President Biden and Senate Democrats to put people over politics. House Democrats will continue to fight for lower costs, better paying jobs, safer communities, and to build an economy from the middle out and the bottom up and not the top down. House Democrats will continue to push back against extremism in this chamber and throughout the country. House Democrats will continue to protect Social Security, protect Medicare, protect Medicaid, protect our children, protect our climate, protect low-income families, protect working families, protect the middle class, protect organized labor, protect the LGBTQ community, protect our veterans, protect older Americans, protect the Affordable Care Act, protect the right to vote, protect the peaceful transfer of power, protect our democracy, and protect a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decision. These are blue lines in the sand, and we will work hard to make sure that they are never crossed. We must also continue to stand by President Biden as he works to bring American hostages and Israeli hostages held by Hamas back home. American hostages and Israeli hostages and international hostages back home. We must also stand by our friends on the international stage. And we have no better friend in the Middle East than the state of Israel. Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish and democratic state the special relationship between the United States and Israel is unbreakable. Our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad, and Israel has a right to defend itself under the international rules of war against the brutal terror unleashed on its citizens by Hamas. Our ironclad commitment to Israel's security and the effort to defeat Hamas is not inconsistent with the goal of achieving a lasting and just peace between Israel and the Palestinian people. In many ways, it is a necessary ingredient because Hamas is not good for Israel Hamas is not good for America. 
Hamas is not good for the free world. Hamas is not good for the democratic aspirations of the Palestinian people. We must also support Ukraine in its courageous effort to defeat Russian aggression. There are only two paths in front of us. We can either stand up for Ukraine or bow down to Vladimir Putin. That is not a difficult choice. We must stand up for America's national security. We must stand up for democracy. We must stand up for freedom. We must stand up for truth. We must stand up for the Ukrainian people until victory is won. It is, it is my expectation that in the next week or so, the Senate will send over for consideration a bipartisan national security funding package for Israel, Ukraine, and our other allies throughout the free world. That also includes humanitarian assistance for Palestinian civilians and others who may be in harm's way. The House of Representatives should take up this national security package and humanitarian relief package immediately, in totality, and without delay. The time for gamesmanship is over. The time for brinksmanship is over. The time for partisanship is over. It's time to get back to doing the business of the American people. Let me conclude. Let me. Let me conclude with an observation about the state of our democracy. Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election. He's doing a great job under difficult circumstances, and no amount of election denialism will ever change that reality. Not now, not ever. Throughout the years, presidents from Ronald Reagan to Barack Obama, Dwight Eisenhower to Lyndon Baines Johnson have spoken to this chamber and urged us to put aside partisan politics for the good <laughs> of the American people. President Lincoln spoke to this Congress on December 1st, 1862, in the middle of the Civil War and noted that we in this institution had the power and bore the responsibility to save the Union. The stakes were high. As articulated by President Lincoln, we could either nobly save or meanly lose America as we know it, the last best hope on Earth. This is a turbulent time in the American journey. And we have but one charge to keep during this moment of great fragility. Our union must be sustained. Our union must be strengthened. Our union must succeed. There are many throughout this country who are understandably alarmed at the turbulence of the moment, at the chaos, the dysfunction, and the extremism that has been unleashed in this chamber from the very beginning of this Congress. But this, too, shall pass. Our country has often confronted adversity, and the good news is we always find a way to make it to the other side. We faced adversity in the 1860s in the middle of the Civil War, when the country was literally tearing itself apart. We faced adversity in October of 1929, when the stock market 
collapse, plunging us into a Great Depression. We faced adversity in December of 1941, when a foreign power unexpectedly struck, plunging us into a world war with the evil empire of Nazi Germany. We faced adversity in the Deep South in the 1950s and 60s when the country was struggling to reconcile the inherent contradictions between Jim Crow segregation and the glorious promises of the Constitution. Right, right. We faced adversity on September 11, 2001, when the towers and the Pentagon were unexpectedly struck, killing thousands of lives in an instant. We faced adversity right here in the House of Representatives, when on January 6, 2021, a violent mob of insurrectionists incited by some in this chamber overran the House floor as part of an effort to halt the peaceful transfer of power. Every time we faced adversity, the good news here in America is that we always overcome. That is the power of American exceptionalism. That is why America is the land of the free and the home of the brave. That is why I remain optimistic about the future of this country. That is why America is the last best hope on earth. God bless you. God bless the House of Representatives. God bless the United States of America.